Good afternoon. Thank you for joining today's 2018 Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program Orientation Webinar. My name is Allison Upton. I'm Project Manager at the Council of State Governments Justice Center, and I will be moderating today's webinar, which is hosted by the U.S. Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Assistance. To give, to give you an overview of today's webinar, first we will do introductions of our panelists and provide an overview of the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program, or JMHCP as we usually say. And next, we'll hear more from the Bureau of Justice Assistance team about the JMHCP grant tracks, budget and grants management, and the performance measurement tool, or PMT for short. We will also provide information about the technical assistance process for grantees, and towards the end of the webinar, we'll have time for questions and answers. And just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, just want to let all the attendees know that any time during the webinar, you can ask a question by typing it into the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand portion of your screen. This includes both technical and content-related questions. So we'll try to reply to technical questions in the chat window as we go. For the content-related questions, we will keep a running list and address them at the end of the webinar. We will do our best to get through as many questions as possible. If you encounter any technical or audio problems during this webinar, please call WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3239. Please understand that there are some technical issues that you, may not, that you may not be able to resolve. So we are recording the webinar and we will post it on our website by the end of the next week. For introductions, our presenters today are Eric Dietrich, who is a Division Chief for the Bureau of Justice Assistance, overseeing the JMHCP and other grants on the program side, and he is also the Acting Associate Deputy Director. Another presenter is Lauren Duhame, who is a Performance Measurement Tool Research Associate, and also a Senior Research Associate with Carnival Associates, supporting the Bureau of Justice Assistance Performance Management Team on programs including JMHCP, Second Chance Act, the Justice Assistance Grant, and Swift Certain Fair Project Hope. We also have Maria Fryer, who is a policy advisor for the Bureau of Justice Assistance. She oversees the Justice and Behavioral Health Portfolio and collaborates with the CSG Justice Center to assist states, local government, and behavioral health organizations to better understand the relationship between the criminal justice system and mental health populations and to help create policy and programming that meets the needs of municipalities and the citizens they serve. And our final presenter is Sarah Wurzberg, who is the Deputy Program Director for the Behavioral Health Division at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Sarah oversees technical assistance focused on behavioral health, corrections, and reentry, and serves as the lead for projects related to substance use and reentry. Through this work, she manages over 100 grantees through the JMHCP and the Second Chance Act. So thank you to all of our presenters for joining the webinar today. And now uh, I will turn things over to Maria Fryer to talk a bit about the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Maria? Great, thanks Allison. Good afternoon everyone and welcome again to this orientation. My name is Maria Fryer and I'm the Policy Advisor for the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Grant Program, or JMHCP in the Policy Office at the Bureau of Justice Assistance, as we call BJA. I work in the Policy Office as a Policy Advisor for Substance Abuse and Mental Health at the Bureau of Justice Assistance. I oversee a number of programs pertaining to the intersection of substance abuse and mental health with the criminal justice system, including this program, the JMHCP, and our law enforcement work. We are a small staff dedicated to translating best and promising practices into quality policies and programs for the criminal justice field. I want to start by saying how proud I am of our JMACP grantees and the work that they do. I'm very familiar with your day-to-day -day because I also come from many of the community programs you represent. Prior to my time at BJA, I was given the responsibility also to find solutions at the state, county, and local levels for justice-involved clients who are in need of treatment and support, and I look forward to working with you to make your JMHCP grants a success. 
And to open this orientation, we have to recognize and acknowledge your accomplishment. You have succeeded in securing grant funding in a very competitive year. Your applications were screened for basic minimum requirements. They were reviewed, rated, and scored by panels of external peer reviewers. And after an internal review by BJA staff, you were recommended to the Assistant Attorney General for funding. So congratulations on your award. Next, a little talk about uh, our expectations of you. Since each program was reviewed and selected based on criteria that uniquely qualified them as most competitive, I want to lay out some very specific expectations that we have of you. We expect you to think about how your systems can be more responsive to people with mental illness and co-occurring mental illness and substance addiction in the, in the justice system. And we expect that you will take on the planning process in all the grants with gusto and be excited to work with your TA provider on this. We're making a difference through this work. You will use validated screening and assessment for mental illness, substance addiction, and criminogenic risk. You will seek appropriate services and identify system gaps for serving people with mental illnesses. And we also expect that you will seek help when help is needed and communicate regularly with your technical assistance coaches and BJA staff. You will have a state policy advisor from our programs office, and you'll be hearing from Eric a little bit later, uh, who will help you with the budget and grants management process. And I'll be there to help on the policy side. So now a little bit about your expectations of us. You can expect we will support and assist you as you set out to reach the goals to enhance your systems and reach pro your program goals. We want you and your staff to have the necessary tools to serve this critically underserved population to help your communities. Both the program staff and the policy staff will be responsive to your inquiries as they arise, whether they are technical, about allowable uses of funds, changes in key staff, requesting no-cost extensions, or whether they are regarding critical changes at the state, county, or local level that you foresee potentially impacting your program. We will provide quality technical assistance through the Council of State Governments Justice Center. So I'd just like to say a few words about the CSG Justice Center. They have been working with JMACP grantees since the program's inception, since the first passage of the Mentally Ill Offender Treatment Crime Reduction Act in 2004, known as MIOCRA, and through their landmark writing of the Consensus Project in 2005, they really brought to light the need to better serve people with mental illness in the justice system. They have been producing helpful publications through the good work of JMHCP grantees, just like all of you, ever since. The Justice Center is the technical assistance provider for JMHCP grantees. Each of you will have a TA coach assigned to you by the Justice Center, and we expect them to call you, email you, challenge you, and support you. Overall, considering everything shared so far, what we are trying to achieve overall is better outcomes for people with mental illness and co-occurring substance addiction in the criminal justice system. Specifically, we're looking to reduce the prevalence of people with mental illnesses in jails and improve access and connection to community-based behavioral health care. This includes the important work to develop police mental health collaboration, work towards collaborative county and regional approaches to look at the data to decrease the number of people with mental illnesses in jail, and have systems think strategically and plan for diversion of people with behavioral health needs. We're excited for you. We're excited for you to work to use data in your system to develop evaluations and track performance measurement through the Performance Measurement Tool, or PMT. Each program has worked so hard to get together an advisory group and put together a great proposal. We want to make sure that you can share your outcomes with us and the field. So just a little bit about the Bureau of Justice Assistance. At BJA, our mission is to provide leadership and services and grant administration and criminal justice policy development to support local, state, and tribal justice strategies to achieve safer communities. Specifically, 
BJA provides funding to support law enforcement, combat violent and drug-related crime, and combat victimization. As recipients of this award, you each share a common goal to effectively serve people with mental illness in your local jurisdiction and to create positive, system-wide change for people with mental illness in the justice system alongside many other professionals across the nation. Also within BJA is the Programs Office. The Programs Office manages the individual awards that each of you have received, and as such, you've been assigned a grant manager. So Nikisha, um, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, will be your contact within BJA and support from Eric Dietrich, who is on our, our call today and who can answer all your questions pertaining to allowable costs, management of the award, and reporting. We work closely together to ensure that all the JMHCP grantees remain on track with their awards, their goals, and their funding. So with this introduction, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Allison, who's going to tell you a little bit more about the CSG Justice Center, and then you'll hear a little bit more from me later uh, specifically regarding JMACP. Allison? Thanks very much, Maria. So next, I'm going to give some background on the Council of State Governments Justice Center. The Justice Center is a national nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that combines the power of a membership association representing state officials in all three branches of government with the expertise of a policy and research team focused on assisting others to attain measurable results. Our staff develops research-driven strategies to increase public safety and strengthen communities. In this slide, we have examples of some of our key publications, all of which are available on the Justice Center website. And these resources really reflect Justice Center core values, which include a commitment to being independent and nonpartisan in every aspect of our work, providing rigorous, trusted, high-quality analysis, developing practical and innovative solutions informed by data and research, promoting collaboration and building consensus, and being inclusive and respectful of diverse views and experiences. So through the JMHCP, BJA aims to really to help states, local government, and tribal organizations improve responses to and outcomes for people with mental illnesses or, or, or co-occurring mental illness and substance addiction who come into contact with the criminal justice system. And BJA is also aiming to support public safety by facilitating collaboration among the criminal justice, juvenile justice, and mental health and substance addictions treatment systems. JMHCP funding was reauthorized through the 21st Century Cures Act. Included in this bill's range of initiatives are several criminal justice reform measures related to the issue of mental health. This bill is really a milestone in the fight to address mental illness and substance addictions in the criminal justice system. So as you can see from this next slide with headlines from around the country, the amount of people with mental illness in the criminal justice system is really widely reported and there is growing awareness of this as a national crisis. So, you know, why are we paying attention to this? What lessons learned do we have from the JMHCP? What resources and strategies can we offer to help address this challenge? So one way we are working to address this is through our technical assistance with the JMHCP grantees to think through diversion opportunities and options in communities. So uh, you know, as we were listening and talking to folks across the country and, and working with our grantees, we really learned that there is no consistent standardized language for commonly used diversion terms around the country. Even for the, the term diversion itself, sometimes it's used interchangeably uh, with jail diversion and diversion. Um, and actually the broadest definition of diversion refers to the rerouting of a person out of the criminal justice system and into treatment services. So our goal is to work with the JMHCP grantees to think through what the options are for behavioral health diversion and reentry strategies. We are in the process of creating a web-based tool to assist in our technical assistance to think through these options and to develop strategies to have multiple options for people with mental illness and substance addictions in the criminal justice system. So with that def definition of diversion in mind, there are many opportunities actually in the criminal justice system process to design and implement diversion programs and practices. 
diversion of people with behavioral health needs does not only happen at one point in the system. People with behavioral health needs may not be eligible for diversion at one intercept, but are eligible at other points. And really, to successfully divert people with behavioral health needs, we need, first of all, to have validated screening and assessment happening at multiple intercepts so that we can identify potentially eligible participants. And we also need to have enough resources to be able to successfully divert and treat people effectively in the community. So this chart actually provides a visual flow of the criminal justice system and where diversion can occur, identifying a lot of the subparts of the system um, and where these subparts can take the lead on different initiatives and when. So you, for example, you can see on the left side of the, of the slide uh, different subparts parts law enforcement, pretrial, courts, and jail. And really the, the larger divide there, or definition, differential that we have is between pre-booking and post-booking diversion programs. So along with thinking through all the different behavioral health diversion strategies, it's also important, and you'll see this on the right-hand side of the slide, um, to think through the community-based continuum of treatment, services, and housing as well. So we're working with grantees really to try to take all the great work they're doing already in responding to, in screening and assessment, and providing treatment to people with behavioral health needs. We're trying to work with grantees to shift from one-off programs to really thinking about a continuum or a systems-wide strategy of diversion interventions. And at a national level, we're also excited to see a lot of focus on pre-booking diversion through another resource available to you, which is the Police Mental Health Collaboration, or PMHC for short, toolkit. Also through the One Mind campaign. We're really excited to be working with law enforcement grantees on advancing police mental health collaboration around the country. And the One Mind campaign is a helpful resource as well, which focuses on uniting local communities public safety organizations, and mental health organizations. So the Police Mental Health Collaboration, or PMHC, framework is a resource intended to assist local leaders, including elected officials, law enforcement, and behavioral health agency executives and their senior personnel who want to begin to look at their police mental health collaborations or improve the existing outcomes of their police mental health collaborations by asking themselves these six questions that you see up on our slide. So these six questions are focused on leadership, protocols, training, resource and services coordination, data, and quality assurance for improving performance. Another key strategy we'd like to provide an overview of is the Stepping Up Initiative. So the Stepping Up Initiative is focused on reducing the number of people with mental illnesses in jails. Since May 2015, more than 450 counties have stepped up to address this issue. We know that a lot of you on the, on the webinar today are part of Stepping Up Counties, and we hope to provide technical assistance that can also link you to additional Stepping Up resources. So the Stepping Up team focuses on a no-nonsense, data-driven approach to public management. And as I mentioned, the stepping up approach is based on six questions and also four key measures really to simplify the hard work of reducing the number of people with serious mental illness booked into jails, shorten the average, of, average length of stay, increasing the percentage of connection to care, and lowering recidivism rates. And overall, through, we wanted to share with you that through our work with grantees, we have seen that for systems across the country, it can be very difficult to use data consistently. Data-informed decision-making is tough, and identifying people with mental illnesses in the criminal justice system is also hard. Through the JMHCP, a key focus will be working with you to have accurate data collection and information. The other major challenge we have seen is identifying system improvement and treatment gaps in the criminal justice system and the community. This goes back to the concept of where to focus the behavioral health diversion strategies, which we all also look forward to working with you on. At the practice level, working to balance criminogenic risk and behavioral health needs is a real challenge we've also seen across systems and jurisdictions. So one resource that can assist in this area is the criminogenic risk and behavioral health framework which was developed to help think through how to identify people with behavioral health needs in the justice system. 
The identification process starts with criminogenic risk assessment and then moves to substance addictions and mental illnesses. So this framework could also be used for prioritizing diversion services. For example, uh, using the framework, you can collect screening and assessment data that helps to identify potentially eligible individuals and understand more about them. You can also differentiate strategies for treatment and supervision based on criminogenic risk level and identified needs, and also based on substance addictions and mental health needs. We've also released a web-based web tool to support case planning for diversion and reentry. This tool, called Collaborative case, Comprehensive Case Planning, was developed to address criminogenic risk and behavioral health needs in a balanced way through the case planning process. It is set to identify a lead case planner from a behavioral health provider, a corrections or community supervision agency. So you can see this is a snapshot of our uh, web-based tool, uh, the main page for it. And if you go and use this tool, you'll also see that we outline uh, 10 priorities for implementing collaborative comprehensive case plans. And this resource is available on the Justice Center website. So when you use this online case planning tool, here's another um, you know, uh, snapshot of, of, the, of the website itself. When you go ahead and use the, the case planning tool, you can select one of the three lead case planners that I just mentioned, uh, a lead case planner example from a behavioral health provider or corrections or community supervision agency. And you can see, you can see in this example, we've used uh, a sample uh, with a lead case planner from a correctional facility, just to show you. Um, when you click uh, on the tool, you can select a, this lead case planner, and then you can see the typical items identified about information that the case, lead case planner can provide and receive from partners such as uh, peer support specialists, the participants th themselves, housing agencies, and you can also uh, take a closer look at case studies that we have from three different jurisdictions. Uh, on this web-based web tool, you can click on any of these colorful squares that you see here to learn more about what information a lead case planner can either give or receive from partners. And so with that overview of some of our resources, now I'm going to turn it back over to Maria from BJA to give an overview of the JMHCP grant program. Maria? Great. Thanks, Allison. With that great head start on TTA, everyone can see what they're, they're in for and looking forward to. Um, so just starting with this overview of JMHCP, um, the goal of JMHCP is to develop collaboration, of course, across the criminal justice and behavioral health systems from law enforcement, pretrial, courts, jails, community, and community supervision, and to learn how to successfully partner um, to increase uh, in efficiency and improve public safety and outcomes for people with mental illness and co-occurring substance abuse in the justice system. It's the only program of its kind, and it does provide response along the criminal justice continuum, um, as I mentioned, from first contact with law enforcement and right on through reentry. Next slide. Nearly $122 million has been awarded through JMHCP. Uh, to improve public safety and responses to people with mental illness. And we're excited to have an increase in funding this year. Uh, in 2018, fiscal year 18, it was dramatically increased uh, to, to 30 million after running between uh, seven and 10 uh, and increasing to 12. This was a huge increase. Next slide. There have been 482 awardees from across the nation representing 49 states and two U.S. territories, American Samoa and Guam, and we're proud to have worked around the country to support these local programs and create a lot of community change. Next slide. This year, there are a total of 47 new grantees. 11 in Category 1, the Collaborative County Grantees, 9 in Law Enforcement uh, for Strategic Planning, and 27 in the Implementation and Expansion category. We have people working throughout the justice system, and law enforcement agencies, again, pretrial, courts, jails, and probation and parole, all in partnership with their local behavioral health provider. Next slide. 
So JMHCP has three categories, and category one, as I mentioned, is the collaborative county approaches to reducing the prevalence of individuals with serious mental illness in jail. And the grant amount varies based on the size of the jurisdiction, as you can see on the slide. And they are, their grants are awarded for 24 months. Next slide. Category two is the strategic planning for law enforcement and mental health collaboration. And these grants are awarded for 12 months with a grant award up to 100,000. Next slide. And then category three, which is the implementation and expansion category. Now this is a larger grant category, but it's also awarded for a longer period of time, uh, 750,000 for up to 36 months or three years. And this is the, the most expansive category we have that actually is for programs that have a well-established program that would like to increase or enhance their response and they're very well established and they can expand or enhance in, in any part of the criminal justice system. Next slide. So a little bit more in depth about each one of these categories. Uh, the Collaborative County Grant involves a planning process with county leadership toward the goal of reducing the number of individuals with serious mental illness and co-occurring mental illness and substance abuse in local jails who can be safely supervised and or treated in the community. The planning and implementation guide is a key to this grant track, which walks grantees through the stepping up planning process. And soon into your grant, you will become very familiar with the planning and implementation guide. Next slide. The allowable activities during the category one Grant follow the six questions and the four key measures that we mentioned or that Allison mentioned earlier in the slide uh, that you saw on that stepping up framework slide. Establishing a group of county team leaders, developing a plan for screening assessment, and establishing baseline data are focus areas of this grant track. Next slide. The goal is to have jurisdictions to be able to identify how many people with serious mental illness are in their jails, work to develop strategies to identify people, refer to services, and think through a system response. This can involve doing comprehensive process analysis and inventory of services, prioritizing new strategies for the greatest impact and using data to track progress. Next slide. Once collaborative county grant teams have finished a thorough planning process, they can shift into implementing their system-wide coordinated approach. Next slide. For category two, strategic planning for the police mental health collaboration grants, agencies will be provided practical and actionable written guidance drawn from the successful experiences of law enforcement to design their police mental health collaboration strategy. The law enforcement mental health partners will work with the TA coach to complete a planning guide. And you'll hear us repeat that planning and implementation guide or planning guide for category two over and over again because it is a, a foundational document to launching your project. Next slide. On category two, teams will work on an action plan called a planning guide that will go over commitment of leadership, collaboration with behavioral health agencies, information sharing, and written policies and procedures. This will include establishing an interagency work group, designing a law enforcement project coordinator to coordinate outreach, engagement, review data, and handle operations, reviewing existing operational procedures and training protocols used in the response to people with mental illness and revising as needed. Next slide. This planning guide will also cover necessary police and mental health resource allocation, training curricula and practices, staffing and performance evaluation, and the use of data for performance and outcome measurement. Next slide. On category three, um, some ways that grantees have used these funds include identifying behavioral health resource gaps, tracking mental health calls for service, 
developing capacity to analyze data, and visit a, a BJA law enforcement learning site. There are 10 learning sites from all types of jurisdictions that you can visit to help learn, learn from and establish a PMHC. And I think that was, <laughs> that might have been for a comment for the category two. I think we're on to category three now. <laughs> so think about, think about visiting a law enforcement mental health learning site if you are a law enforcement planning grant. Now on to category three. This is the implementation and expansion grantees. So folks across the, ju the justice system have, are represented in, in this, what we call our bread and butter of our work over the years, the category three grantees. All the grantees are working toward developing diversion and reentry strategies for people with mental illnesses and co-occurring substance addiction. There is an implementation and expansion guide that you will work with with your TA coach during the planning phase of the grant. During the planning phase, you can spend up to 150,000. Next slide. <clears throat> okay, so once the guide has been approved by BJA, you will move on to the implementation phase. We will encourage you to think of this at the systems level once again. We're trying to think very broadly and very comprehensively across across the system, so not just about the program or a targeted number of people that you propose to serve. Next slide. The Category 3 grantees providing, provide training, access to health care, and other services. They also are law enforcement projects, free trial pro programs, courts, jails, and community supervision focused on best practices for diversion, case management, and reentry. Screening assessment, information sharing, specialized caseloads, and service coordination are ways grantees have used their funds in the past. So that's a long laundry list of activities, and Category 3 is very broad. So there's lots that you can do in that category. So as Alice mentioned, Allison mentioned before, a lot of the work tends to follow the behavioral health criminogenic risk framework. So now that you've heard a bit about your fellow grantees and those out there doing the work right now, I'm gonna turn it over to Eric uh, Dietrich from the BJA Programs Office to provide some budget and grants management tips for you. Thank you. Eric? Good afternoon, everybody. As Maria mentioned, my name's Eric Dietrich. I'm a division chief in BJA and the program side, and we handle the grants management for you and along with you. Um, Nikisha Love is one of the grant managers for the Justice Mental Health Program. Um, Veronica Munson was formerly one of the other grant managers, uh, but she retired about a week ago. So if you have Veronica Munson listed on your grant agreement, um, bear with me. We're going to um, reassign her awards, just haven't been able to do it yet. Um, in the interim, of course, you can contact me and I will make sure to get anything that needs to be done on your award done. Uh, just wanted to start with, uh, which I assume will be a question coming up as far as the government shutdown. Um, obviously, since I'm talking to you, our office is still open. We had um, some extra funding. Um, as it is right now, we have enough funding to keep us operational through 5 p.m. Friday, January 18th. And if there is no resolution after that, then all of OJP's um, staff and systems will cease operations until we get an appropriation. Um, just starting off, this, is, uh, this slide gives you the overview of what I'm going to talk about, and I will move on to the first section. Uh, obviously, everything is done in grants management system, GMS, which is our system of record for your grant award management. Hopefully by now you're pretty familiar with it, and hopefully by now you've all processed your award acceptances, the deadline of which was 45 days after we issued the award. If you're having issues with the award acceptance, um, please contact me. Um, no word about them deobligating ones that are not, not accepted, but um, technically they should have been accepted within 45 days. Um, but again, everything that you do once your award is operational is gonna be in a grants management system most commonly being grant adjustment notices, financial reporting, progress reporting, um, monitoring, which is mainly what BGA does, 
um, and then also the closeout of your award at the end. Uh, there's a couple of helpful links on the slide too, and there's some more re resources in this um, slide deck if you need to access it. Um, these are immediate post-award actions. Um, hopefully you've already started along this, this route. Um, you've had a while, had your awards for a while. Um, I think one thing that we always stress is that you read your award document very carefully, and that includes the special conditions which are um, within the award document. Um, obviously, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Nikisha or myself, and we will answer them for you. Um, just a note, in prior years for Justice Mental Health, the award project period began um, the first date of the federal physical year, which is October, but um, we switched it for FY18, so your project period for your awards um, didn't begin until January 1. No cost incurred prior to that date will be reimbursed. I uh, mentioned special conditions. Um, they're exactly that, terms and conditions of your award. Um, we apply standard special conditions across all of our grant programs. They'll all be on the ER document. You also have some sp program specific special conditions just for justice, mental health, or just for the type of program. And then we'll also have some withholding special conditions that we added during processing of your application, either for missing information or for the approval of your budget which is completed by our accounting office, which is OCFO. Um, just reiterate again, take time to review these special conditions and ask us if you have any questions about them. Here is a page from your award, example of a special condition page from your award document. More on special conditions, um, this is just a few examples of the standard special conditions that we apply to all of our awards. Um, note that there's a special condition that requires you to follow everything in the DOJ grants financial guide, so you definitely want to familiar yourself with that. Um, and these are some of the examples of the other federal laws and requirements that you'll be expected to follow. I uh, mentioned the withholding special conditions. Withholding special condition is one that we added that prohibits obligation, expenditure, or drawdown of federal funds until the conditions are met. Um, we add one if your budget was not reviewed before the award, which is typically the case. Um, our accounting office, which is OCFO, adds a withholding special condition until they can clear your budget. The other ones that were added would be added by BJA, including Nikisha and myself, if there was a missing document or if a docking document was insufficient or if we had questions about something. For categories one and three, there's a partial withholding special condition, and that's for, as Maria mentioned, for the planning stage. So for category one, you'll have access to up to $100,000 to complete the P&I guide. And for three, that's 150,000. And once that's completed and approved, we'll remove that special condition. Included a note in here that if you have multiple withholding special conditions, obviously one that is withholding the full amount of the award will kind of um, take precedent over the partial hold. So for example, if you have a withholding special condition for your budget clearance, which most of you have, um, you won't be able to access the $100,000 to start your planning process for Category 1 until all of the 100% hold special conditions have been removed. Progress reporting requirements. Um, PMT people will go into more of that later, but your performance metrics will be reported in the PMT system quarterly. And this lists the quarters and the due dates within 30 days at the end of the quarter. But as far as your progress reporting, which will be done in GMS, it is semi-annual. First one for you is gonna be due in July for the first half of the year, January through June. 
And in the GMS progress report, we expect you to upload PDF versions of the PMT reports that you conducted, that you completed in a different system, and upload those to your progress report. It's very important to be on time with your progress report. If it's overdue, there'll be a hold automatically placed on your funds, and also overdue reports counts toward uh, what we can do as far as our assessment scores of grantee risk. And that would um, influence monitoring, potentially influence um, your risk score for future years. One little tip, if you have a technical issue with generating your PMT reports or reporting in PMT, obviously they'll go over that and getting that straight with their help desk, but if you're up against the deadline for submitting your progress report in GMS, you can just go ahead and submit your progress report in GMS um, by the deadline so that it's not marked overdue, and Nikisha will send it back to you or your other grant manager will send it back to you in GMS so that you can attach the PMT report once you get it. Um, that's just kind of a little tip because otherwise the automatic hold will get placed on your award. Uh, financial status reports, also called the SF-425, also due quarterly within 30 days of the end of the quarter. They're submitted in GMS by the financial point of contact on your award. If you have problems with the financial report, contact OCFO customer service. And there's the contact for it. And I should mention that same thing with financial reports. If they are overdue, an automatic hold will be placed on your award and also counts negatively towards your risk score. FADA reporting is reporting of a subaward agreement through using federal funds. It's um, made, you would submit this report if you entered into a subaward at the end of the month following the subaward that you entered and you would use the FSRS website to submit it. And this is only for subawards of 25,000 or more. Um, here's just some tips on submitting your financial report. Probably should have been the slide before, but uh, you don't report you must report actual funds spent on your financial report, not your drawdown amounts. Your report from the recipient level, which means you as the recipient, you don't need to re report your sub-recipient expenditures. You're going to report on match requirement. Justice Mental Health has a 20% match requirement, so you're going to report on your match, and you're also going to have to account for your match in the same way that you do for any other expenditure. You must report your program income as cumulatively, not the quarterly amount. And you must report your indirect cost rate based on whatever your rate was and enter that in in response. And as a tip there, you're going to report every quarter whether you have expenses or not. Just enter zero and make sure you submit it on time. Um, just some financial tips. Obviously, you need to follow the DOJ grants financial guide, so familiar yourself with that. The overall rules for whether a cost is allowable or not for a federal award are if it is reasonable, allocable, and necessary to the project. Um, more information than on that on the financial guide, or you can look into the uniform guidance, which is what it's drawn from, which is 2 CFR Part 200, which has the cost principles for federal awards. Grants financial management training, you have a special condition on your award that is going to require the primary POC listed in GMS to complete the grants financial management training within 120 days of award acceptance. And this also must be completed by the financial point of contact, actually all financial points of contact that are active on your award within 120 days of award acceptance. You can complete this online, which is probably the easiest route, and here's a link to it. You can also do it in person. The in-person ones are very popular, 
So if you haven't registered by now, um, you might have difficulty getting in until later this year, in which case you won't have met the 120-day requirement. As soon as you have completed this training, you should email your grant manager certificate so that that can be marked in GMS. For some of you, this may be a withholding special condition, in which case you wouldn't have access to funds until you completed it. But most of you, it's not going to be withholding. I should also mention that this is also a requirement if the POC changes at any point during your award or your financial point of contact changes, the new person will have to complete it within 120 days of their taking over as the POC in GMS. Um, here's some more financial information resources. Uh, I forgot to up update the top one. It's no longer 2015 financial guide. It's been updated since then, and it's actually being updated quarterly now, but that's the correct link for it, so you'll be able to find the financial guide online there. Um, uniform guidance, which I mentioned earlier, which is the federal-wide guidance. It, it applies to all grants. Um, there's a link to it on our website. and has it right there. This just goes over the unallowable costs that are listed in the solicitation. These are um, ones that are not unique to just mental health, but to a couple other BGA grant programs. Um, I won't go through the list, but you can see the list here. It does include gas cards, which is a, something that some people ask. Gas cards are also unallowable. There's a lot of confusion um, among anybody that does grants between what is considered a subaward or what is or what we now call it not just a contract but a procurement contract. And so in recent years OJP has tried to create more resources for you to make the determination of that. And here are links to the resources. There's a toolkit, um, there's a checklist and a fact sheet for sole source procurement. Um, the checklist should be especially useful as you Look at your, um, you know, your service providers or any other outside folks that you're going to be paying to make a determination on whether they would be a subaward or a procurement contract. Obviously, your special conditions will have some information on your requirements based on whether one is a subrecipient or basically someone you're giving a subaward to, or a contractor. Um, here's some information on selecting and monitoring a subrecipient. So if you do have if you are issuing subawards, you have certain responsibilities to monitor them in the same way that BGA will be monitoring you as a recipient of one of our grants. Um, I'm not going to read all of this to you, but this des describes the different requirements that you must as far as must follow as far as selecting and monitoring subrecipients or subawardees. Again, the toolkit that was linked before should have this information in it as well. You can always consult the uniform guidance, which is um, the section on subrecipient monitoring is 200.331. Trying to click my next slide, and it's not working. There we go. Grant adjustment notices. Oh, I went twice. Hang on. Going back. Grant adjustment notices. Changes to your project um, are submitted in GMS as a grant adjustment notice or GAN. Um, you'll submit them in GMS. We will review them. These are the different types. Budget modifications, changes in scope. Notice cost extension, which is project period extension. Um, We've recently tightened up our um, rules on these. Uniform guidance says you can only have one up to 12 months, so we've tightened that restriction. Um, in some rare cases, we make exceptions to that, but not very often. Point of contact information, again, if you need to change the POC in GMS, you need to submit that and change it so that the new person will start getting contact access to GMS and emails. Removal of special conditions is a type of GAN that only the Keisha 
and I and others in BGA can submit on your behalf, and that's when we receive necessary information to remove the withholding special conditions that I mentioned to you earlier. Um, sole source procurement is not very common, but that's also a type of GAN, and any of the costs requiring prior approval, which are listed in the financial guide or solicitation. Um, project scope GAN is a fairly common one. If you're altering programmatic activities, um, changing the target population, anything that's kind of significantly changing from their program plan, from your proposal, um, you're going to want to submit a project scope GAN. Budget modification is also fairly common. Um, I'll go over the situations where you need to request prior approval for a budget change. If you are moving any amount of funds into a cost category that was not in the original budget, for example, if your application budget is approved with no costs in the supplies category and then six months you decide you need to um, purchase some supplies, you'll need to submit a budget modification regardless of how much you need to spend because it was there were no costs in that category before. Um, for those of you who have indirect costs in your budget, any change to the dollar amount of the indirect cost total needs to be submitted as a budget modification. And then the 10% rule. 10% rule is if you have a change to any cost category, for example, personnel, supplies, contractual, whatever, that is going to be increasing or decreasing by 10% or more of the total award amount, you need to submit a budget modification for that change. This does not apply to any award that is less than 250000 which is the um, acquisition threshold currently. So to give you an example, if your award is $300,000 and you want to move $31,000 from personnel to other categories, you would need to submit a budget modification. If you were going to move $29,000 out of personnel, you would not be required according to the 10% rule. You may be required to submit one based on the other rules. Um, compliance monitoring, BGA, I mean, everything we do, the grant management side of it, Nikisha and the other grant managers is, is monitoring compliance and progress. That's when we review progress reports or GANs. Um, we conduct desk reviews on every award at least once a year. And then we also conduct in-depth monitoring. In-depth monitoring can be done as a site visit or what we call a programmatic desk review, in-depth programmatic desk review, where we do it remotely, ask you for some documents, and then we have a conference call. In either case, the, the point isn't just to play gotcha. It's obviously we're checking for compliance with your special conditions and the federal rules. But we're also trying to help identify and resolve problems or issues so that you can have a successful project. Um, we make selections on grant monitoring every year, which grants we're going to monitor. We do use a risk assessment process that I mentioned earlier. We also make our decision based on other factors. Um, additional information, here's the BJA main phone number. If for some reason you can't reach us directly, you can always call them. BJA website, listing of our funding opportunities. Current contacts for Justice Mental Health, I mentioned Nikisha, who's one of the grant managers or state policy advisor, and here's my information as division chief. And again, if you, Veronica Munson is listed on your award document, feel free to contact me, and we will get you assigned to a new grant manager as soon as we can. Uh, here's some resources I mentioned earlier. Some helpful links to do some more research on the grants management system, how to use it. Training tool has some useful tips, some step by step on how to submit GANs, how to submit progress reports, financial reports. And here are links for the PMT site and some other resources that would be useful to you. That's all I have. Um, like I said, my contact information there. If you have any questions, feel free to email me or Nikisha, and best of luck.
Thank you so much, Eric. Um, so we appreciate all of your information. And now we will turn it over to Lauren, who will speak more with us about the Performance Measurement Tool, or PMT. Lauren? Thanks, Allison. <clears throat> so at the end of this section, you should walk away with a better understanding of why BJA requires you to report performance measures, how the PMT team uses this information, and also how to set up and access the PMT. On the next slide, we ask, we go over why we even have performance measures. Performance management helps BJA and its grantees understand their progress towards key goals and objectives. We use performance measures to identify successes and opportunities for improvement, to track grant activity and progress to inform decision making, to understand funding decisions and their impact on our strategic plan, and because it's actually required to comply with the Government Performance and Results Modernization Act. <clears throat> the next slide shows a few examples of the kinds of reports that we generate from the performance measure data you report. Both of these screenshots show the front pages of annual program reports that use quantitative and qualitative performance data to provide a high-level summary of grantee activity and achievement at the program level. These types of reports are posted on the BJA website and are shared with a variety of audiences, including OJP and BJA leadership, Congress, and the general public. Next slide. As I mentioned in the earlier part of this training, the questions in the PMT are made up of two main categories. The first is the quantitative program performance measures. This is where you will enter numeric data you collected over the course of the reporting period. These questions are similar to how many dollars were spent on law enforcement equipment during this reporting period or how many arrests were made during this reporting period. The second section of questions are qualitative narrative questions. <clears throat> These questions are open-ended and do not require a numeric response. The narrative questions that are answered during the April to June and October to December reporting periods fall into this category. An example of this type of question could be, what type of equipment was purchased with BJA funding during this reporting period or what challenges did you face in completing your program goals during this reporting period? Remember that these questions are meant to capture the full experience you have with conducting activities with BJA funds. So the more information you provide, the better the data is. The quantitative data that you report is used to establish baselines, track performance against program goals, and create a nationwide picture of numeric data for BJA. Narrative questions are open-ended and give grantees a chance to express in their own words how their experience has been in conducting their program. The next slide outlines the PMT reporting schedule. As you may know, the PMT collects data for a three-month period of activity referred to as a reporting period. You will have 30 days after the close of the reporting period to enter data into the PMT system. After you complete your data entry, you will be prompted by the PMT to create a, port, uh, to create a report of this information. Every six months, grantees are, are required to upload a semi-annual report into GMS, which is also generated from the PMT system. This semi-annual report is uploaded as an attachment to your progress report in GMS and is due once in January and once in July. This report contains the narrative questions we talked about a few slides ago. Closeout or final reports should only be completed once all grant funding has been expended and will need to be uploaded into GMS as well. If you need assistance in uploading a report to GMS, please contact the GMS Help Desk. As a reminder, all of these reports are always available in the PMT for you to create and save as many times as needed. 
You should also keep in mind that BJA refu reviews grantees' report status and data every quarter to ensure validity and compliance with reporting requirements, so it's vital to fulfill every reporting requirement your agency has in accordance with your grant. <clears throat> On the next slide, we continue with the reporting schedule. And this is a reporting schedule that details the time frame for each reporting period, the type of data required, and the due dates for submitting it in the PMT and GMS. You will enter program performance measures every quarter and enter the narrative section twice a year during the April to June and October to December reporting periods. This table can be found in the PMT on the information and resources page as well. As a reminder, the PMT is accessible year-round for data review, report generation, account creation, and more. But data entry is only scheduled for the month following the close of a reporting period based on the scheduled PMT due date. If you need to edit any data outside of the scheduled due dates, you will need to contact the PMT help desk. Next slide. So what exactly is the PMT? The PMT is the performance measurement tool. And this is the online data collection tool for the Office of Justice Programs grant recipients. It is structured as an online questionnaire and is available year round. The PMT contains a lot of information and tools to assist you in your reporting. So let's take a deeper look. On the next slide, you'll see three important steps that will get you, that will help to get you set up to report in the PMT. We will go through each step now. The first step on the next slide is login and account creation. To access the performance measurement tool, please visit the PMT single sign-on page, which is listed in many of the slides here today. The single sign-on page allows multiple OJP grant recipients to access all of their awards using one username and password. So for example, if your organization receives funding from both BJA and the Office of Victims of Crime, you can log in with one username and password and access both of those PMT applications. The point of contact listed for each federal award in the grants management system is also considered the primary point of contact in the PMT, and they will be the person who will have first contact with the PMT system. If this person is not already a registered PMT user, he or she will receive an email from the PMT with instructions on how to create a new account when contact information is updated in the PMT. The point of contact may then add additional users who will also receive a registration link via email to create their own unique account to access the system. As a note, you must be a BJA grantee or subrecipient to set up a username and password and all individual users must have their own unique username and password. Once your unique account is created, Enter your registered email address as your username along with your password to log in. Next slide. <clears throat> Here's an example of the email new users will receive when their account is created. To set up a new user account, click on the link in the email. The password you create is based on OJP security requirements and is similar to the policy used by other DOJ sites. Passwords must be at least 12 characters and contain at least one uppercase letter, one lowercase letter, one number, and one special character. If you, requ if you request to have your password reset, you will not be able to use the same password as the one you used within the last 24 password change requests. Next slide. Once all account information is up to date, select 
BJA PMT to continue. Once you select BJA PMT to continue, it will bring you to your user profile page on the next slide. The first profile page of the PMT displays the various awards your organization receives from a particular OJP program. Next slide. If your organization receives funds from various sources within BJA, you will have access to multiple profiles. The picture on the slide depicts an organization who receives funding directly from BJA, making them a grantee, and who also receives funding from another potential state agency, making them a subgrantee. To continue to enter or edit data, select the grantee or subgrantee profile you want to report on by clicking on the plus sign and then your organization's name. As a note, you will not see this page if you only have one PMT profile or award, but instead you will be brought right into the performance measurement tool. Next page. If you are logging into the PMT for the first time, the system will direct you to the profile page. This information comes from GMS. If any of it is incorrect, please be sure to contact GMS and submit a grant adjustment notice to update the contact information in that system. Make sure you also inform the PMT help desk along with your BJA state policy advisor of any necessary changes. Having accurate contact information listed in the PMT is extremely important so that you will receive email updates, reminders, notices, and other necessary user materials. If others within your organization also need access to enter or edit data, go to the Manage User page and add them. Only add users who need access to the BJA PMT to complete data entry and reporting. Adding a user automatically sends that person an email with a link to create and complete a user account. Next slide. If you're a returning user, you'll be directed to the information and resources page upon logging in. This page gives you access to important documents regarding the grant program, such as this user guide the frequently asked questions, and a copy of the performance measures, as well as any updates. Keep in mind that you can access the profile and the information and resources pages at any time while logged into the PMT. Now is a good time to remind users that the PMT will time users out after 30 minutes of inactivity. So be sure to press the Save button whenever it is available so your data is not erased. Additionally, users should be sure not to use the back or forward button on their web browser as that will produce system errors, but instead use the buttons within the PMT to navigate within the system. If you have any questions about the PMT or how to set up your account, please feel free to contact to contact our help desk at any point. Thank you. And Allison, I will send it back to you. Great, thank you so much, Lauren. We appreciate all your information today. And so the last topic we will cover today is an overview of JMHCP technical assistance, or TA as we usually say. So as Maria Fryer mentioned earlier, the Council of State Governments Justice Center is the training and technical assistance provider or TA provider for 2018 JMHC, JMHCP grantees and we're really looking forward to working with you all. As a JMHCP grantee, you will have a variety of, of TA assistance components available to your team throughout the entire active cycle of your grant. So to start with, you're going to have a TA provider who will be your main point of contact for technical assistance. You will also have access to peer learning opportunities, including connection to other grantees who might be doing similar work or may have faced similar challenges. And you'll also have the opportunity, opportunity to participate in learning communities. 
You'll have access to a variety of tools to assist with your project, including resources about best practices, training opportunities offered by BJA and the Justice Center, as well as other key partners. And if your team is interested in obtaining resources on any given topic, we really encourage you to approach your TA provider and let them know and they can assist you with this. You'll also have access to experts, the TA providers, other Justice Center colleagues, and consultants really offer a wide range of content knowledge that we can bring to the table to assist you in your work. So just by way of giving a couple of examples, uh, some topics that grantees have been interested in learning more uh, about in, in the past uh, include pre-arrest diversion, gender responsive services for women with justice system involvement, screening and assessment for people with behavioral health needs, and data collection and evaluation. So your TA providers are going to be working with you and will be looking out for opportunities to connect you with these experts just to help support and enhance your work. Through the entire grant cycle, you can expect to have monthly calls with your TA provider, and early in the planning phase, you will be working in intensively on the planning and implementation guide or the planning guide for Category 2 grantees, uh, which is a grant requirement. We strive to be as individualized as possible through the TA process. So a combination of peer learning, resources, and even an in-person site visit for some grant projects can all be comp components of your JMHCP technical assistance. We do this so that your TA provider can work with you and be as responsive as possible to each grantee team's unique needs and support your team in meeting your project goals as well as completing your, the grant requirements. So this slide details many of the ways that your TA provider can assist you on your grant project, orientation to the TA process, and as I mentioned, completion of the P&I guide or the planning guide are really common activities early in the grant cycle. Then as you move through the grant process, your TA provider will assist you later with implementation activities, any challenges that you're facing, as well as strategies for sustainability once the grant funding ends. If you have not already been contacted by your TA provider, you should be hearing from them very soon, and they will provide you with email and phone contact information, and will work with you to set up your monthly calls. This next slide um, is, is really a great one. It illustrates key resources and peer connections specifically designed for each of the JMHCP grant tracks. So, for, you can see on the left, for Category 1 Collaborative County grantees, we offer the Stepping Up resources, which includes the six questions document that um, Maria and I referenced earlier. Uh, this is the document on reducing the number of people with mental illnesses in jails. And also another resource available to Category 1 are Innovator Counties. These are counties who have made progress already in terms of data collection at the county level, and they are available and interested in sharing their expertise with other grant projects so that you can uh, have peer learning. For Category 2 law enforcement planning grantees, we have the PMHC Toolkit, the Police Mental Health Collaboration Toolkit, which we referenced earlier, as well as access to the 10 law enforcement mental health learning sites. And for Category 3, Implementation and Expansion grantees, the suite of behavioral health diversion resources will be available to you, as well as the four criminal justice mental health learning sites. So for each grant track, we've worked uh, with JMHCP grantees to develop resources and peer learning that can help support your work. On this next slide, uh, we have a snapshot here. The Justice Center has also has a monthly newsletter, which is a really great way to stay informed about upcoming trainings, new resources, funding opportunities, and other key developments at this intersection between behavioral health and criminal justice systems. So we really strongly encourage you to sign up for this newsletter through the CSG, excuse me, through the CSG Justice Center website. And so um, now we'd like to move into the question and answer portion of the webinar. And just as a reminder, you can chat in your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom right-hand corner of your screens. Um, and also as we're taking questions, we're going to advance uh, in a little bit, advance the remainder of the slides, which, which have more information about um, some upcoming grant-specific webinar dates, key references and resources presenter contact information, and also the CSG Justice Center newsletter sign up. So now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Sarah, to moderate the questions and answers. Sarah? 
Thanks, Allison. So we had a few that already came in, and just as Allison said, you can still ask more questions in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. So the first question is from a grantee, and they said, what if they've never received the award documentation? They actually, the first notification that the person feels like they have received was the reminder about the webinar yesterday. So they have concerns about um, whether the award was accepted and things along those lines. Um, I think Eric or Maria, can you try to answer that question, please? Yeah, this is Eric. Um, um, okay, they, go ahead, Eric. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Maria. Just, you need to get, send me an email with your information and I can look into what the situation is and get back in touch with you. Excellent, thanks so much, Eric. That's really helpful. It sounds like there might have been some confusion there. So glad we can get to the bottom of that. So the next question is related to the um, planning guides and it is, um, can the new planning guide be completed and submitted prior to eight months for the category one participants? And so I think I can um, try to answer that question. So you can work with your TA provider to try to come up with an appropriate timeline to review and complete those for each grant program. And we'll work with you to then try to meet that. We do wanna make sure that you have gone through a thorough planning process to answer all the questions and we work with you to complete the guide and then we will actually send it to BJA, so to the programs team and the policy team in order to, to review it and get it approved. So there is some time related to that as well. But glad that you are eager to complete it and we look forward to working with you on it. We had another question related to when they would actually be able to receive the guides. And I can answer that question as well. That's a great question. So we're just in the process of putting the final, final touches on the guides. Your TA providers will be able to send those to you really soon, so within the next week. And I know that the TA providers have also been working to schedule the first calls. So they look forward to speaking with you and providing those as one of the discussion items on the call. So just a reminder to folks, if you have any additional questions, you can use the question and answer box at the bottom of the screen. And this webinar will be recorded and we will distribute a link to it fairly soon. And I think there was also a question about whether the PowerPoint slides would be available as well. And we will be able to provide um, a PDF version of the PowerPoint slides to everyone. These links on it are super helpful. So we wanna make sure that you have all of these references and links, as well as the contact information for all of our presenters. Okay, so there was another question about um, the no cost extension requests and the person was asking, can you clarify the extension cost request um, if it's available? They're saying, for example, our grant ends 12-31-2020, could we extend it to 6-30-2021? So Eric, I think I'll turn that over to you. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, the, the rule is one extension request up to 12 months for, for a grant. So if it got to the end of your project period and um, for whatever reason, verified delays, some things out of your control that you can't complete your project, then you can submit an extension request um, for additional time, up to one for 12 months. Great, thank you so much for that clarification. And that's something that you would actually be applying for at the end of the grant award period. So another question also related to budget, which is usually a popular topic on people's mind. And uh, there was just a question on if we are aware of how long the uh, budget approval process might take. And I believe that kind of depends on what the specific issues are, but Eric or Maria, if you have other thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, the, the budget clearances are done by our accounting office, so CFO, and they go in a particular order. Um, 
they were extremely backlogged this past year because almost all of BGA's awards, not just mental, just as mental health, but almost all of our over 4,000 awards, um, did not receive budget clearance before the time we made the award, which means that we have to do them after. And um, with various other delays, they are still going through them, and in some cases, um, several hundred of our FY18 awards have not even been reviewed yet. So as soon as OCFO reviews it, um, they will contact your grant manager and, and either um, include some review notes that you would need to respond to, or they would have to um, clear the budget and they would submit again to remove the hold for that particular for that particular special condition. Um, again, I cannot I cannot predict the time frame on it. I, I'm sorry. They, all I can say is that um, we work with them every single day and try and try to get updates. Um, they're working as fast as they can and, and going in order. Great, thanks so much, Eric. And we know that they have a large workload, so everyone um, stay tuned for that. We all know you're excited to start your projects and we're excited to have you start them as well. So we have another budget-related question, which I guess is, is the theme for the question. So I think there was just a, a clarification point on the 10% rule for changes within your budget. They just wanted clarification on it was 10% of the category or 10% of the entire award would necessitate a budget adjustment? It's 10% of the entire award moved from or into a single category. So 300, say you have a $300,000 award and you want to move $31,000 into the personnel category, you would need to request a budget modification because that would be over 10% of the total award moved into one category. Excellent, thank you so much for that clarification. The next question is, can, um, can we comment on our experience with previous sites concerning advantages of a dedicated grants manager on the awardee side, and is that common? So that's a really interesting question, and I think there's a couple of different ways to answer this. So I think it's helpful, definitely, so within the grants management system, you'll have a programmatic point of contact and financial point of contact. When it comes to grants manager for the award, there's a couple different roles that person can play. So my answer would be, so it, it depends on the site, but one, a grants manager can play more of a compliance function where they're helping with uploading the reports and doing different pieces of that. And then there's also a project coordinator side to this. And sometimes that is the same person and sometimes that is a different person. But often when it comes to coordinating these types of projects, it is helpful to have a dedicated person who's able to do that. We find that that's often useful that they're you know, kind of in touch with the different pieces of it so that way they have a greater understanding of what's going on and really helping to drive the process forward in their county, a big part of each of these grant tracks is systematic change. So having someone dedicated is, um, does make sense in most cases. And hopefully that answers that person's questions. Um, if anyone else has anything to add, feel, Maria, feel free to jump in if you have more. Sarah, this is Maria. I thought you did a really great job at explaining. Um, there's, a, there's definitely, um, you know, with federal awards, there's a there's a lot um, to pay attention to um, online and, and with the system and with you know GMS and and dates and all those due dates and special conditions and things like that. Um, so having somebody sort of in touch and with their eyes on that frequently is really helpful. And um, and of course the coordination as well. Um, and you know it. Sometimes it can get a little bit difficult when, say, for instance, you know, it's the, it's the county that applies, but then another office is doing the implementation. Um, there sometimes can be a disconnect, and I just urge, you know, just lots of communication, lots of relationship building, lots of uh, reaching out if you don't have answers to things, and, you know, that just that whole coordination piece around you know, smooth launch and implementation of a program. Um, well, just like the program is called, you know, Justice and Mental Health Collaboration, I'm sure 
that you all are experts at collaborating and building partnership. And it's almost like you kind of have to add us to the list. We have to build a partnership with us too and a partnership with your TA provider just to make sure that information is, is flowing um, when it needs to, um, to to the people that need to have it and that there's somebody on the ground sort of um, collecting the information and getting it back to the people that, that, are, that are doing the work. Um, so I would just kind of strongly you know, just suggest, um, you know, that you have that, that coordination. But I think, Sarah, you did a really great job. Great. Thank you, Maria. And I think to that end, you know, there's certainly no wrong door. If you have a question, your TA provider will try to direct you to the right person, or if you ask any of us, we'll direct you back to whoever it makes sense. We know it can be confusing when you, ha when you have a new award and there's a lot of different people just on this webinar telling you different things. Okay, so if you have any more final questions, you can chat it into the chat box. We have about two to three more minutes left, but if we don't get any more, we will be able to wrap up early. So we are not seeing any more questions at this time, and I'm sure as you have them, feel free to contact your TA provider, our partners at the Department of Justice, or through the PMT as well. I'll turn it back over to Allison to close out the webinar. Thanks, Sarah, and thank you again to all of our panelists today. We appreciate all of the information that you shared uh, and your enthusiasm for the JMHCP. And we would just want to, again, thank all of the uh, grantee teams members that are on the, on the uh, training today. Congratulate you again on your award, and we really look forward to working with you. And thank you very much for your attendance today. Have a great week.